we're making in this retreat. We thank you because of the kingdom in all its various aspects and ramifications are revealing to us. We're asking, Lord, that tonight again you reveal this important aspect of the kingdom unto every heart in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, that your spirit will interpret and apply the word to every heart, enlighten every one of us, and make us, Lord, to live, to act, to behave. Everywhere we go, everywhere we find ourselves, according to your word in Jesus' name, implant the very nature of Christ in every heart. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. What do you mean from Mark chapter 12 from verse 28? Mark chapter 12 verse 28. One of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, if I'm perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him which the first commandment of all. And Jesus answered him, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord with all, with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like unto it, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than this. Tonight we're looking at kingdom love. And you'll find from the old scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament, you'll find the emphasis on love. God himself is love. And as he redeems his people, he brings them to himself and he wants us to manifest that nature of God, which is love. In Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 25, Luke Chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up. That he is a lawyer in the sense they understood, not in the sense we understand. He scribe. And somebody who knew the scriptures, the Old Testament, and who would want to defend the Old Testament. But he came now and he was tempting the Lord. He tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Great question. And yet with a wrong heart. A great question. And yet with a wrong motive. He said, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Even though his motive was wrong, the answer was still given. Give him because of you, because of me, so that we'll know what it takes to enter into the kingdom of God. He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? He brought the question to the Lord, and he wanted to know, I want eternal life. I want everlasting life. I want the life in the kingdom. And now Jesus asked, a lawyer, you know the word, you know the Old Testament, what is written in the law? 
And he, the lawyer himself, described himself, and strange said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. If you knew that, why didn't you do that? Why are you coming to ask the question? He knew that already. And now he said, here is what the Almighty God himself had commanded, that you will love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And of course, you also love your neighbor as yourself. And he said unto him, that he is the scribe, that is the lawyer said unto Christ, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. This do, and thou shalt live. That ye so want to know how to have eternal life. Do that. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, all your strength. If you do that every day, Every moment, always, without any break, without any interruption, you will have eternal life. But you understand, the Lord Jesus Christ knew he couldn't do that in his own strength. You will need conversion. You will need circumcision of heart. And self will need to be crucified. And you will need to have a new nature before you can do that. Jesus knew that. And if the man was sincere, all he would ask is, what how can I do that? I don't have the strength. I don't have the grace. I don't have the power. And then the Lord will show him the way to life, the way to conversion, and the way to transformation. But in verse 29, but he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I'm to love God with all my heart. I know God is the creator. I know him. I should love him with all my soul, all my mind, all my strength, with everything I've got. But on this other side of loving my neighbor, who is my neighbor, in verse 30, and Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of all his raiment and wounded him and departed and left him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest in that way and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. You see, this man was a religious man, like the priest, a religious man. And he said, you want to know your neighbor? There's somebody, a creature of God. He was going from this place to that place. And he had this challenge that the thieves, the robbers met him, stripped him, took everything he had, and left him half dead. And this priest came by. He had performed all the services in the temple, in the synagogue. It's like, I am through. Everything the Lord requires of me, I have done in the temple. I've done in the synagogue. And now, here was an opportunity to obey the word of the Lord and to love his neighbor. But he passed by. And they were told in verse 32. And he also says, likewise, a Levite. This is another person, a temple laborer, a temple server, a temple servant, a temple worker. And likewise, a Levite, when, when, uh, when he was at the place, uh, came. And looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, 
came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him and bowed up his wounds. And then were told, pouring oil and wine, first age to treat him and set him on his own beast, on his own ass, and brought him in into the inn and inn and took care of him and he and on the morrow the following day when he departed he took out two pairs to this wages and gave them to the host to the innkeeper and said unto him take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now comes the question in verse 36. Which now of these three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, thinkest thou? was neighbor to him that fell among the thieves. And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, everybody, go and do thou likewise. Don't forget the question, what shall I do? So I can inherit eternal life, everlasting life. If it's only just to believe, and that's all. And whatever happens in your life, after that, no big deal. Nothing important. Raise up your hand. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're through. If it was like that, Jesus will not tell the story. But as the man said, what shall I do? That I will inherit everlasting life after you are converted, after you are born again, after you come to know the Lord, and a new nature has been given to you, and a new life has begun, and a new character has been formed in you. There is something to do. Number one, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and don't stop there, and you love your neighbor. You love every human being that you come across, your wife, your husband, your children, your parents, your teachers, your principal, your co-workers, your pastors, the members of the church, and people outside, every stranger that you meet, that is the neighbor. And Jesus told this parable, and he said, this is what you will do, and then you will have everlasting life, you'll have eternal life. That means you will enter into that place of glory and that place of peace and that place of joy and you'll be there forevermore. That's why we're looking at this important subject tonight and we're taking this text in Luke to be the foundation of what we're talking about as to love to God and love to our neighbor and love to everybody around us. Practical love, compassionate love, tangible love, a heartfelt love, a kind of love that is practical, that is positive, that you can tell here is what I'm to do. My friend is in need. My neighbor is in need. My stranger is in need. A co-worker is in need. And I happen to have what it takes so I can help my neighbor. He says, that's our neighbor. And if we're really born again, if we're really children of God, we're going to manifest, we're going to demonstrate practical love unto the people we come across. Kingdom love. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the honest confession and covenant in kingdom love. When you realize what kingdom love is all about, there's a confession. And there is a covenant. We come into relationship with the Lord. And in that relationship with the Lord, there is something that happens in our heart. 
He makes connection with us. He converts us. He brings us into a covenant. And that covenant has love at the center. Look at that again in Luke chapter 10. Reading from verse 27 and verse 28. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. He must be thy God. You must have been converted. You must be able to refer to him, a father which art in heaven. There must be the father-child relationship that you know, number one, is your creator. Number two, is your redeemer, is your savior. It's the one that has taken your sins away and he has given you a new life. And now because you know, it's your creator. Because you know it's your father. Because you know it's your redeemer. You will love him, the Lord thy God, and with all thine heart. That means you will not have any sin in the corner of your mind, in the corner of your heart, that will not love the Lord. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, you love the Lord. And it says that is the first commandment and then the second part, you love your neighbor as yourself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. Thou hast answered well. Do this, and thou shalt live. The man was quoting from the Old Testament. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 10. What does it take to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, what's the interpretation of that? Because we cannot see God face to face. Nobody has seen God and still remains alive. And we cannot interact with him like we interact with our fellow brother, fellow sister. And it's God in heaven. And we are here on earth. How then can we love him with all the heart? And with all the soul, and with all the mind, and with all the strength, and with everything within us to love him without reservation, and to love him without interruption, and to love him all the time. How do we do that? Deuteronomy chapter 10, I'm reading here from verse 12. Deuteronomy chapter 10, and we're reading from verse 12. In verse 12, here is what the Lord is saying. And now Israel... What does the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God? That's part of loving him. And to walk in all his ways. That's part of loving him. And to love him. And to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. It says if you're going to love the Lord your God, Look for his commandments, search for his commandments, look for his ways, and look for his requirement, and look for what he desires. And then he tells us in verse 13 to keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. And then he says, Behold the heaven. And the heaven of heavens is the Lord thy God. And the earth also with all that therein is. Only, only the Lord has delighted in thy fathers to love them and to choose them. And he chose the, their seed after them and after he has also loved you above all people as it is this day look at verse 16 circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and that ye be no more stiff neck is telling us that conversion is very important if you're going to love the lord your god with all your heart a sinner cannot love the lord with all his heart all his soul on his mind an unconverted person cannot love the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind. An unregenerate man, a self-centered man, a carnal man, the natural man who has not been touched by the grace of God cannot love God with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his mind. There is circumcision. There is conversion. There is sanctification. 
and there's that circumcision of heart and he takes that root of sin away and he takes the Adamic nature away and then you are able to love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind Deuteronomy chapter 13 I'm reading here from verse 1 what's involved in loving the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul it tells us in chapter 13 if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and they give it thee a sign or a wonder and the sign or the wonder come to pass whereof he is speak unto thee saying let us go at other gods which thou hast not known let us serve them look at this look at this thou shalt not hack him unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the lord your god proves you to know whether ye love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul it says that's involved in loving the lord your god somebody comes to you and he presents another god to you actually an idol to you and he says let's depart from the living god let's depart from the true god and let us go and serve an idol let's go into occultism and let's go into satan worship he says you'll say no because you must love the lord with all your heart and you cannot share your heart you cannot share your mind you cannot share your strength you cannot share your worship you cannot share your adoration uh, between god and another personality is saying then that if you're going to love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind idolatry must vanish away idolatry must be something you don't take part in how do you do that without conversion how do you do that without salvation in fact it tells us in deuteronomy chapter 30 deuteronomy chapter 30 reading here from verse 6 deuteronomy chapter 30 reading from verse 6 and the lord thy god will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed why why is that circumcision necessary there's no physical circumcision now this not the circumcision of the flesh now is the circumcision of the heart why is that necessary look at this to love the lord thy god with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live it's telling us there must be divine oppression if we're just uh, you know at the retreat or at a meeting or at the church service and we just hear the word and in our own strength, we rush out. I'm going to love the Lord with all my heart, by my own consecration, by my own strength, in my own power. You cannot do it. The Adamic nature is still there. The self-centeredness is still there. He must circumcise your heart. He must cleanse your heart. He must change your heart. He must change the inner man. And it is after that conversion, it is after that cleansing has taken place. It is after that oppression of the Spirit of God has taken place and has circumcised your heart that now you'll be able to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And his commandments will be essential to you. And his commandments will be important unto you. Loving God means that you love his commandments. Loving God means that you love his covenant. Loving God means that you love everything that God has said, everything the Lord is doing. Joshua chapter 23. In Joshua chapter 23, reading from verse 11. Joshua chapter 23, verse 11. Take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves that she love the Lord your God. Take good heed. Are you saved? Take good heed. Are you sanctified? Take good heed. Has the oppression of God been performed in your heart? Take good heed that she love the Lord. What does that mean? How does that interpret? And what does that translate to? 
if you love the Lord, like Joshua is saying, emphasizing here, what's, what's the meaning of that in your life? Look at verse 12. Else, if you do in any way, any wise, go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they unto you. No, for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and it shall be traps unto you as coaches in your sides and thorns in your eyes until ye perish from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. You know what Joshua is saying? He's saying that if you love God with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind and all your strength, you will not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Because here is the commandment of the Lord. Here is the requirement of the Lord. And if you love God, and if you love his commandment, and you love his ordinance, you're going to do what the Lord expects you to do. And you will not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But you know, before you can love the Lord like that, and obey his word and do his will something must have taken place in your heart and so if we're going to have eternal life we need to love the lord with all our heart all our soul all our minds and then we need to keep the commandments of the lord we need to walk in the way of the lord and we need to be what he wants us to be and yet before that can happen there must be the divine oppression of the Almighty God upon your heart, upon your life. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. And we're reading from verse 38. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 38. It says, And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Something has taken place, a divine oppression, a supernatural manifestation. God who said in this chapter that he is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, nothing shall be impossible unto him. And conversion is the work of God. Sanctification is the work of God. Purity of heart is the work of God. The removal of that Adamic nature that will not allow us to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind is the work of God. And he removes that and now he says, I'll be there, God, and they shall be my people. In verse 39, and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. They may fear me and serve me and love me forever. And it says, for the good of them and diligent and, uh, and their children after them. Verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not I will not uh, depart from them, not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. That's what it takes, a divine oppression in the heart, a great work of grace in the heart, salvation, sanctification, and then it turns our heart to be obedient to him. It says that's what it takes and then we'll be able to obey this commandment and the honest confession and the covenant in a kingdom love will be manifested through us. Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22 verse 36 and verse 37. Matthew chapter 22 verse 36 and it says in verse 36, Master, which is the great commandment in the law. Verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God 
with all thy with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind that's a great commandment and whatever else will be if we don't obey that how can we say that we are keeping the great commandment and it tells us we cannot share that love with anything or any person Matthew chapter 6 reading from verse 19 Matthew chapter 6 reading from verse 19 lay not all for yourselves treasures upon earth that's what the Lord Jesus is saying and it is based on the love of God you love God more than material things you love God more than earthly things you love God more than earthly treasures and he says, if that is the case, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moss and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But then he says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Whatever is important to you, and whatever the Lord demands, whatever the service of God demands, your heart, your mind, your strength, your soul, your talent, your skill, your ability, your property, your possession, your money, whatever you can precious and like a treasure, lay off for yourselves treasures in heaven. It says, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and nor steal. For where your treasure is there, shall your heart be also. And then he tells us in verse 24, No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Ye cannot love God and mammon. It says, with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our mind, without reservation, without interruption, we love the Lord. And that's only possible after we're converted. And that's only easy when we're sanctified. And he has taken away that root of self, the root of of sin, the nature of Satan, that will say, me, I will, I will, I will not have any reference unto the Lord. We're coming back to Luke chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 29. Luke chapter 10, verse 29, and he willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And who is my neighbor? He gave the answer himself that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And the Lord said, that's right. That's the right answer. Love the Lord. Love his creatures. Love the creator. Love his creatures. Love the people that come across your way. But he said, who is my neighbor afterward? I am a Jew. Who is my neighbor? I'm a Pharisee. Who is my neighbor? I'm a very strict person, a separatist. Who is my neighbor? Is it only the people who are separatists like myself? Pharisees like myself. Who is my neighbor? I am an Israelite. You see, it's only the Israelites that are my neighbors. Those Gentiles and those Samaritans and those strangers. Are they my neighbors too? You see, there are people that read only one part of their Bible. And this man claimed to have read the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, we're told what kind of love we ought to have. And to whom we ought to show that love. Point number two now. The hypocritical character 
and condemnation of kingdom liabilities. The hypocritical character and condemnation of kingdom liabilities. In the story that Jesus told to illustrate who is our neighbor, he said, there was a man that fell among robbers on the way, and they stripped him, and they beat him, and they hurt him, and they left him up dead. And then somebody, a priest, actually a liability to the kingdom of God, says, I believe in God, I believe in his kingdom, I believe his word, and I must love my neighbor as myself, but he proved to be a liability, a liar. And then a Levite came, and he also would have said, I serve God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and I love God, I love his service. Every Sabbath day, I have to be in the synagogue, in the temple. He also was a liability. He saw the creature of God, and he saw the person that was left up dead, and he did nothing. Are there not people like that today? Once they go to their denomination, once they go to their Christian assembly, once they come to the church, they sing that song. I've done everything I ought to do. And then when it comes to practical demonstration of love to our neighbor, they don't even understand who their neighbors are. They think the people in my little circle the people in my little house fellowship, the people in my little local church, the people in our denomination, those are our neighbors. And these uh, such people, they prove liabilities in the kingdom of God. The hypocritical character and condemnation of kingdom liabilities. Let's look at what the Old Testament says as to what love we manifest as to what love we show to our neighbors. It tells us in Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. And I'm reading from verse 34. Leviticus chapter 19. We're looking at verse 34. Here in verse 34 it says, But the stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you and thou shalt love him as thyself that's Old Testament there's a light of scripture and this interpretation who is my neighbor the stranger the one you have never met the one you have never seen and you're looking at him and he has a need in his life he has the need of the water of life. He has the need of the bread of life. He has the need of care. He has the need of the light. He has the need for somebody to show him the way to life eternal. Love him as thyself. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. It says of Satan, you were a stranger too. A stranger to the grace of God. A stranger to the commonwealth of Israel, a stranger to the salvation of the Lord, and somebody treated you as a neighbor and he showed you the way. He said, Go and do thou likewise. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10, and I'm reading here from verse 19. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 19. Love ye therefore the stranger. Look at this man saying, who is my neighbor? Who should I love? I should love my neighbor as myself. But who is my neighbor? Love ye therefore the stranger. For ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 13. Proverbs chapter 21. We're reading here from verse 13. In verse 13, it says, Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor. Who is my neighbor? The poor. Those who have nothing wherewithal, they take care of themselves. 
the sick and you know it they are oppressed and you know it they are helpless and you know it but they happen not to be a member of your family they happen not to be a member of your local church they happen not to be a person that is familiar to you it's just a neighbor living in the community and it says whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor he also shall cry himself but shall not be heard love your neighbor love that poor man love that poor woman not for what you can get out of them because they have nothing that they can pay back but just because you want to obey the commandment of the Lord to love your neighbor as yourself. In Proverbs chapter 24, Proverbs chapter 24, reading from verse 11 and from verse 12, it says, If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, priest, if thou forbear to to deliver them that are drawn unto death. Levite, if you forbear to deliver them that are drawn to death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou seest, behold, when you eat not, we don't know him, we don't know his situation, we don't know his predicament, we don't know what he's going through, and we pretend as sieve, we do not understand what their needs are. Does not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, does not he know it? And shall not he render to everyone, every man, according as his works? You see the story of that Levite? And the story of that um, of that uh, priest that turned the other that turned the other way, and they turned their eyes and they withdrew the help, the compassion away from that man on the road. Uh, you see what happened to them, and what Jesus said is illustrated in the story of Jonah. Come to Jonah chapter one. Jonah chapter one. Who is my neighbor? The one that is not of my tribe. The one that is not of my nation. The one that is not of my denomination. Who is my neighbor? The one that has a need. The need of material things here on earth. And the need of a greater thing, which is the gospel, the word of God, that were to reach out to them and not be thinking i don't have time i don't have this i don't have this let's look at this man hypocritical character and the condemnation of kingdom liabilities jonah chapter one verse one now the word of the lord came unto jonah the son of amittai saying arise go to nineveh that great city and cry against it for their wickedness has come up before me. If the Lord had told him to go to a city in Israel, he'll run, he'll get there. Those are my neighbors. If the Lord had told him to go to a Jew, he'll run and get there. That's my neighbor. But now Nineveh, enemy nation, Gentiles, the people that do not know the Lord. It says in verse 3, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tashish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a sheep going to Tashish and then so is a page the fear thereof and went down into it to go with them into Tashish from the presence of the Lord that's it I'll perform any duty in Israel I'll perform any duty inside the local church. I'll perform any duty in my denomination. But when it comes to going out to the people we don't know and touching the people, the lives of the people we don't know, uh -uh, Jonah is not going to give in to that. Well, you know the story of what happened, but look at verse 15 of chapter 1. 
in chapter 5, in chapter 1, verse 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish. How many days? I said, how many days and nights? Three days and three nights. Because he will not show compassion to his neighbor. And he brought trouble upon all those people in the sheep. How about you? How about you? Go preach the gospel to every creature. Are you like a Jonah? Tell them of the love of God. Are you like a Jonah? Tell the sinner there's a possibility of repenting and coming to the Lord. Are you like Jonah? And eventually look at chapter 2. When he got into the inside the fish, then Jonah prayed unto the Lord. Is God out of the fish's belly? Look at verse 7. When my soul fainted within me. Why? Because he didn't love his neighbor as himself. He didn't define his neighbor very well. He didn't understand. Those Ninevites are the creatures of God. And God will have compassion on them. And it's, it's through you, Jonah the prophet, the Lord will show the compassion. And because he didn't show that compassion, that's why all the trouble came. He said, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy those who observe lying vanities that those Nevites they cannot be saved lying vanities God does not love those Nevites those, uh, uh, those Nevites they have gone beyond the day of grace and I'm not going to waste my time reaching out to them talking to them Jonah said, he observed lying vanities, he forsook his own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee for the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that, that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. And then he goes on, he tells us in verse 10, and the Lord speak unto the fish, and it vomited Jonah, vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. But you know, the commandment still came to him. The requirement still came to him. Those are your neighbors. Do something. Those sinners that are perishing, they are your neighbors. Say something. Preach the gospel. Tell them the good news. Chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city. And preach unto each the preaching that I bid thee. You have the message already. Go and declare it. You have the gospel already. Put it out. Give it out. So Jonah arose and he went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of a three days journey. In verse 4, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and, cry, and he cried, and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He had thought the people are so wicked, they might not repent after all. And if I'm forced into it, there was no love in his heart to his neighbor. Do you have the love for your neighbor? You see them every day, you meet them every day. You walk in the same office together. You're in the same community together. Do you have the love to them? In verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God. Look at that. And proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne. And he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and uh, sat in ashes. He said, why did he have to do that? Well, Jonah did not tell them what to do. He only told them, 40 days, and he never shall be overthrown. 
and he said it with a desire, a wish that that will happen, that they will not repent. But the people did what they knew to do, and they repented. If we will tell them the message, if we will give them the message, we'll be manifesting the love of God, and the love of God will draw them into the kingdom. And he caused it, that is, the king caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh. It says uh, in that uh, place uh, that uh, by in Nineveh, by the commandment and the decree of the king and his nobles, I, and it says, saying, uh, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. And then it says, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. That's what they knew how to do. And they still got to repent. And eventually we're told in verse 10, and God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. Let's come back to Jonah. What kind of a preacher was he? What kind of a prophet was he? What kind of a neighbor was he? What kind of a worshiper was he? To love God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your spirit, with everything within you. And to love the way of God, to love the decision of God, and to love whatever God decides to do. He decided he was going to save those Ninevites. He was going to forgive them. If you love God with all your heart, all your, all your soul, all your mind, you will love what God has done. And if you love the Ninevites, you will be happy that eventually they made the gospel out of the threatening message that Jonah had given. Look at chapter 4 verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Angry at what? Angry at the conversion of those Ninevites. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was this not my sin? When I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before unto Tashish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repented, and repented thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I pray thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. He didn't understand the mercy of God, the compassion of God. He didn't understand what he ought to do. And what those Ninevites have received. In verse 4, Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? Doest thou well to be angry? In verse 11, And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than three, uh, six score thousand persons, that cannot discern between the right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. The Lord is telling us we need to understand the love of God. If we understand the love of God, we'll reach out to sinners, we'll reach out to backsliders, we'll not grudge them, we'll present the gospel to them, we'll show them the way of life, the way of eternal life, the way of salvation, that's the greatest expression of our love to our neighbors. And if we're not doing that, it shows we don't have the love we we'll pretend to have. Loving your neighbor as yourself. 
in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. Nevertheless, I have some watch against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. We might still be ministering the church. We might still be officiating the church. We might still be doing our duty like the priests and the Levites in the local assembly, in the synagogue, in the temple. But the Lord is saying here, we have left our first love. In verse 5, remember therefore from whence thou art falling, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candle's cheek from its place, except thou repent. Point number one, the honest confession and covenant in kingdom love. Point number two, the hypocritical character and condemnation of kingdom liabilities. Point number three now, the heirs' crucifixion. Heirs of the kingdom. Heirs of the kingdom. We must be crucified. We must be circumcised in heart. The heirs' crucifixion and Christ-likeness in kingdom lifestyle. Kingdom lifestyle. We're like Christ. He was crucified. We're crucified. He died. We died to sin. We died to self. He was buried. We buried in baptism. He rose again. We rise with him. And because we're totally and fully identified with him, that's why we manifest the love of God that like he manifested toward God and towards every creature of God. Let's look at the fact that we're heirs of the kingdom. In uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. And if ye be Christ, if ye are born again, and if ye be Christ, if ye have repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and if ye be Christ, if compassion has taken place, and if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? Heirs according to the promise. Chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. In verse 6, and because ye are sons, God has sent forth the, uh, the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ, an heir of God through the salvation we have in Christ, having that salvation, then we can do what the Lord expects us to do. But we need an experience in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. The old man is the old nature. The old man is a carnal nature. The old man is a natural self. The old man is the Adamic nature in there. And it says, as we come to the Lord, we need to know this. Except that old man is crucified. Except that old man is taken from the heart. Except that old man is replaced. Is taken away. Will still be behaving like the old man. But knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed not just endured not just chained up and not just uh, covered up and not just modified but the very body of sin the nucleus of sin might be destroyed and henceforth that we should not serve 
sin. When that has taken place, then it will be easy for us to be obedient to the word of the Lord, that we love him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, and love our neighbor to give him what he needs, which we have, what of life, bread of life, the gospel, the word of salvation, the word of eternal life, and also material things to be of help to our neighbor. Crucify the air, crucify. It tells us in Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 20, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. I, that is the real me, the old me, my nature, the carnality within, the self within, the one that shared the nature of Father and the nature of Satan, that I is already crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The Christ likeness we find in kingdom lifestyle. The heir is crucified, and after that crucifixion, is made like unto Christ. He has the likeness of Christ in his soul, in his mind, in his spirit. And because of that Christ likeness, he lives the kingdom lifestyle. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And therefore, he's able to live, and we're able to live the life of love. It tells us in First Peter chapter 1, First Peter chapter 1, the lifestyle of Christ, the life of love. Love in all its ramifications, love in all its demonstrations, love in all its manifestations. In First Peter chapter 1, verse 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. You are pardoned, you are saved. You are purified, you are sanctified. And seeing that your soul has been purified, now you can obey the truth through the Spirit unto unpretending love, on hypocritical love, on ashamed love, on feigned love of the brethren. There's no pretense. It says it's an unfeigned love of the brethren, seeing that she see that she love one another with a pure heart fervently with a pure heart fervently chapter 2 first peter chapter 2 verse 21 it says for even here unto were ye called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that we should follow his steps remember the Syrophoenician woman that came asking for healing my daughter is grievously vexed of the devil and the disciples said turn her away drive her away she's making a noise after us but jesus manifested love he says go and do likewise he has left us an example you remember his son that came speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. He didn't say you are a gentle, you are a soldier, you are a centurion, you are the captain of an army. I don't have any time for you. He spoke the word and the servant was healed. You remember the woman at the well? The disciples were even surprised. He was talking to the woman. But salvation came to that woman. And he says Christ has left us an example that we should follow his steps. We're looking at chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 7, chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, she husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not answered. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, Love as brethren, 
and be pitiful and be courteous. Be pitiful and be courteous. And it says in that love, loving your neighbor as yourself, your brother as yourself, your sister as yourself, and loving your husband, loving your wife, loving your children, loving your parents as yourself, manifesting the love of God. It says in verse 9, not rendering evil for evil, no railing for railing, no revenge, no retaliation, no unforgiving spirit. It says, but contrary wise, blessing, knowing that ye are there unto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his leaves from that they speak no girl. Let him eschew evil. Let him shun evil. Let him reject evil. Let him turn away totally from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and eschew it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. First John chapter 2. In First John chapter 2, the heirs crucifixion. Once the Adamic nature is crucified, and the body of sin is taken out of the way, that henceforth we shall not serve sin, and we know that we have the testimony, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, and I live like Christ. I have the nature of Christ in me. Then I'm able to live the kingdom lifestyle. And it says in chapter 2 of First John, verse 6, he that says he abideth in him ought himself so to walk even as he walked as the Christ likeness the way he loved we love that way the way he showed mercy we showed mercy that way and the way he had compassion we show compassion we demonstrate compassion that way look at verse 9 he that says in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now he that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is no occasion of stumbling in him then he goes on to say in verse 11 but he that hated his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because the darkness has blinded his eyes chapter 3 in chapter 3 of First John, we're reading from verse 10. It says, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness, is not of God, is of the devil, neither he that loveth not his brother, the one who can injure his brother, and the one who can lead his brother to backsliding, and the one who can lead his brother to sinning, he does not have the love of God in him. It's not showing love, he says, for this is the message in verse 11, that she had from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, not as Cain, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you, ye you know we are passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Because there's no pretense in that love, there's no hypocrisy in that love, it's sincere. It's transparent, it's truthful, and there's nothing to hide. And it says, this is how we know. We are passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Look at chapter 4, verse 7. In chapter 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. We're born again, let us love one another. We're converted, let us love one another. We belong to the kingdom, let us love one another. 
we are circumcised and self is taken away, let us love one another. We profess to have the nature of God. We profess to be sanctified. We profess that the Adamic nature is no more there. If we are brethren that way, beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. He may profess, he may testify, but he has something in the heart, and he's doing something secretly in the corner of his mind that doesn't show love. The, the testimony may be like that of the Apostle Paul. The testimony may be like that of the Ethiopian eunuch. And yet, if the love of God is not there, it says that fellow is deceiving himself, deceiving herself. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him and it says here in his love here in his love not that we love god no he loved the force but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation the atonement the covering the solution the salvation for our sin that's what the lord is telling us is calling us to a life that is not like that of Christ because we're crucified with him, because we have died with him, and because we have risen with him. It tells us in Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection. Set your love, set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, the old man is dead, the old man is gone, the damnic nature is dead, is crucified, and is for taking out of the way. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory because of that in verse 12 put she put on therefore as the elect of god holy and beloved bowels of mercies kindness humbleness of mind meekness and long suffering forbearing one another forgiving one another if any man has a quarrel, if any man has a disagreement, if any man has a misunderstanding against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. I'm coming back to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, and we're reading from verse 36. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. Master, Lord, this man did not say Lord, but he is our Lord, Savior, Redeemer, the captain of our salvation which is the great commandment in the law. And Jesus says unto him, and Jesus is saying unto you, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and the great commandment and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Lord is telling us then, as we have come to know the Lord, and we're now citizens of the kingdom, we need to demonstrate this. 
that whatever it is it is the remnant of the old nature in our heart in our mind in our soul will take that remnant to the cross of calvary and allow him to purge us purify us sanctify us take that self-centeredness away from us so that by grace by divine strength he'll make it possible for us to love god with all our heart and to love the brethren love the neighbors love the strangers love everyone like ourselves let's rise up and talk to the lord in prayer this is the great commandment and is going to examine us on the final day on the basis of this that he has spoken to us kingdom love the love of the king in the heart of the king's children open your mouth and talk to the lord in prayer